Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to this week's edition of Imperial as One's Belonging series. It's, an ex it's a series which explores the lived experiences of individuals from the Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. Individuals who have been willing to share their stories about how they gain their sense of identity and their sense of belonging. And I do say this every week I, because we have very, very special guests. And this week we have Professor Sandhya um, Vishwajwarya. And she is the professor of, she's a professor at and academic at the Institute of um, Science in Bangalore in India. But she's also one of the Provost Visiting Professors in Biochemistry at Imperial College. Sandhya, I want to just say a big welcome and thank you for being our guest today on Belonging. It's a real pleasure to, to meet and to talk to you. I'm going to start off by asking my first question, which is, can you tell me what it was that gave you your sense of identity and your sense of belonging as you were growing up? I think I've been extremely privileged. First of all, let me start by thanking you for inviting me for this session. It, it's a great pleasure to talk to the Imperial community. Um, I think I've been privileged by the fact that I've been brought up in a number of different countries around the world while I was growing up. And this has given me uh, a world perspective and an acceptance of all types of lives and all types of people which is a, goes a long way in terms of being who I am and the way I look at life. My early childhood was um, initially as a very young child in Ethiopia, where my parents moved to become teachers. And uh, they spent about a couple of years there in Ethiopia before they moved to London. And this was the time when there was a lot of uh, immigration into the UK. I can't say things were very comfortable for us in London. The London in the 60s is, was not the London that we see today, um, which is so welcoming and all encompassing of all types of people. We at that time found it extremely difficult to get accommodation in London because they were not very keen on families with children, coloreds or dogs. So on two out of three counts, we struggled a little and I do know that my parents went through a great deal of hardships but being very young you're not really aware of what this means in a larger context. My father completed his PhD and then moved on to join the uh, educational uh, council in Stevenage and there things were very different. Um, my mother continued teaching. I joined a school, Fairlands Junior School, where my brother and I both were there. My sister was born um, some years later. And uh, she was born in India. My father insisted that my mother go back to India and have her baby there and come back to London. So <laughs> that, 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 that was the deep sense of patriotism, at least, that my father had and inculcated in us to some level. Um, school was terrific for me. Um, and I really do believe that the way that I've looked at life has been largely shaped by the early education that I had in England. Um, I was academically inclined and therefore I enjoyed going to school, but I also appreciate the fact that so much emphasis was given on sports, art, um, painting as part of the curriculum in a school. And this is very alien to the way education is done in India. And so I think this breadth of exposure to different disciplines really shaped my thinking for a large part of my life. I then moved on to um, a girls' grammar school. In those days, grammar school still existed. And I was in a girls' school. And I, again, I, I was very happy there. And very interestingly, I was leaning towards the humanities. Um, I had decided to take O-levels in music, um, Latin, English, Russian, German. You know, I, I was completely in humanities and I had dropped all science subjects at that point of time. Um, then my father decided that he needed to go back to India, and therefore this was via Zambia. And the choice was left to me as to whether I was to continue in England, uh, because I had a very good English friend and her parents offered to let me stay with them till I completed my O-levels, and then go on for my A-levels, which, you know, I had sites of Oxford and Cambridge at that time, which were the standard uh, 
aspirations of most uh, academically inclined people, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, but and so my parents gave me a choice and said, would you like to stay back or would you like to move with us to Zambia? Um, it was a difficult decision, but I did make the decision that I would go with my parents. And I think a large part of it had to do with, at that time, feeling a little alienated in the community I was in. Um, I was, I think, maybe one or two Indian children in the entire school. And I, I, I somehow felt I needed the reassurance of the family with me at that point of time. And I didn't... Uh, feel I could be here on my own without them around. Zambia was very interesting, but I went there with a great degree of disappointment because I was extremely happy educationally in England. Uh, completed my O-levels in Zambia, did extremely well, but then knew that my parents' destiny was India. And so I came back to India to complete my bachelor's. I got married soon after my bachelor's uh, degree and then went on to do my master's in chemistry. Um, it was a big switch for me in Zambia because I had to forgo, forgo all the artistic inclinations that I had or the humanities inclinations and completely switch to science, whether it was uh, physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics. And the transition, I don't think I regret at all because fortunately I have dual interests and so while I my profession is science I have a, I spend a lot of time in my life continuing my interests in English literature theater music etc um, and then that's how I was shaped I think I think living in Africa living in Europe living in different cities in India has all really helped me become the person that I am which I hope people consider is accepting of a variety of ways of living life. I don't think there is one correct way of yeah. living a life. I, 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 I was just, as I was listening to it, some, in my mind came the words like mapping the world, because it, it almost seemed as though you were born in India, transitioned to Ethiopia, came across to England. Most of all of those were because of your father's interests. Yes yeah and his his pursuits so they didn't have any you didn't have any control over any of those no. but the consequences <laughs> of you um being his daughter and I thought that the story which you told about your little sister being your mum having to go back to to give birth and then come back because your dad wanted another Indian daughter he did he, he, you, yes. know, he, you know <laughs> I thought that, that that's brilliant um but in all of those, I suppose the first one, the transition from India to Ethiopia, because you were so young, you probably wouldn't have had much memory of no. that. But that Not transition really. from Ethiopia to England um, in your formative years. So I, I just want to explore that because you also mentioned about the fact that the slogans on the doors were no children, no Irish no people of color i'm i'm nicening up the language but effectively yes. and no dogs <laughs> yes. yeah yes. so um so so it wasn't a welcoming environment but yeah. yet you felt welcome or not i'm not going to say you you felt welcome how how would you describe how you felt at that time i think i had good friends uh, I made friends with a number of uh, English children. And so I don't think I felt alienated at that level. However, culturally, I was perhaps a little bit of a misfit. I was so interested in studying and academia, which mm -hmm. is not really the way teenagers in the UK were at that time. They mm -hmm. were more interested in partying at the Mecca and, you know, the, the, the going for dances and which boyfriend and which girlfriend. And, you know, th these are things that were completely alien to me. And I, to that extent, felt alienated at that level because every Monday morning, all the girls would be talking about what they did on Friday night and what they did on Saturday night and this boy and that boy. And I would just, have to just keep quiet because it didn't connect with me I would be at home reading a book or something so, yeah. you know, <laughs> so 
but I don't think I ever felt any hostility towards me. And that could have been because I was in a girls' school and uh, because I was academically quite good. I think the other students sort of had a little bit of respect for me. You know, yeah. how does she do it? How does she always get yeah. good marks? And, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. I do know that my brother went through a lot more difficulty than I did because he was in a comprehensive school and faced a greater degree of prejudice. You know, I think this was the time when colonialism was sort of waning, at least British colonialism was mm -hmm. waning. And I think the general attitude at that time was that the British being in other countries was good for the country because they brought in advancement, they brought in technology, they brought in a, you know, a way of life which was different to the primitive existence. Mm. And I'm quoting Shakespeare. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, sorry, I'm not quoting Shakespeare. I'm quoting Churchill here because the other day I visited the Churchill war rooms and I was frankly appalled to see what Churchill said at that time, that at the time of India's independence, uh, we need to liberate 300 million primitive people from the way they are living. And, you know, so <laughs> I, th I think that cultural attitude yeah. was prevalent in the 60s amongst the British because the politicians were speaking that way. Yeah. I, I, I don't blame any you know, individual in that sense. It, it, it was the political scenario then that made hostility acceptable and a belief that we were not as good as yeah. the white people. And um, as I said, I think because I was academically doing well, people realized that, you know, this seems an anomaly. How yeah. come she's doing well when, you know, she's not supposed to be able to do this? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it was... That kind but of, that, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking <laughs> because you just briefly touched on the fact that your your younger brother, who went to a comprehensive, didn't find the experience as yeah. as um, welcoming or as as um, I'm trying to find the right word. He didn't find the experience um, a pleasant one compared to you. So that for you, education was almost like a superpower. It was a yeah. it was a shield that protected Absolutely. you from some of these more harsher things and assumptions which were made about people of color of the time yeah um i think you put it beautifully i think yeah. uh, you've put it very well yes it was a shield yeah i studying my desire to do well at school yeah in exams was my protection yeah I, I, I was good in other things too um, because of sports i played for the county in badminton I used to represent the school in tennis, in hockey. So all of those things were also there for me. Yeah. But that ability to excel in exams yeah. was, I think, a very good protection mechanism that I had. It's, but you're an all-rounder then, because it sounds mm. to me you you you, <laughs> you were you were going to abandon the sciences because you you know. Um, but you you were sport you enjoyed sports you enjoyed your academic progress so in reality you were an asset which people could say so in terms of not to use the words of of Churchill but when he's talking about you would have been someone there say oh we could train that one because they have the potential <laughs> you know they, that, the you know the, the, it's, um, the, the, this is kind of, I'm just thinking about what what may have been going through don't quote me on this anyone but that's, <laughs> that's, that's a good one yes yeah? uh, it, it, I, I think so I, and I think I was held up as an example by the teachers the teachers loved me mm -hmm. headmistress loved me in girls grammar school if I'd stayed on for another year I was destined to become head girl yeah. I knew it and yeah. I could feel it in terms of the responsibilities and the example that I was setting. Uh, but of course, we left before that. Um, but yes, I, I I think so. I was trainable, highly trainable yeah. Yeah. through my Indian genes. <laughs> yeah, literally, literally. Uh, there, 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 was, there was another thing that you said, though, because you had that big choice to make at age 15. Yeah, at age 15. Yeah. Um, with your Deep your father 16, looking yeah. to yeah. go back to pursue um work then in in Zambia yes yeah. 
um you had a big choice do i stay or do i go yeah mm -hmm. and rationalizing mm -hmm. not just your experience but what what the experience would be like for you had you stayed so you yes. had aspirations of going to oxford or cambridge yes. yeah um to do arts to do humanity or which subjects in particular or, or was it was there any particular subject which you thought this is the one that I would would like to potentially pursue? For me, it was languages. Right. I was very good at languages. And so yeah. I suspect that had I gone on to an A-level, English literature would definitely have been mm -hmm. a major thrust for me because mm -hmm. I, I was I, I just loved reading literature, mm -hmm. etc. Um, music was... I was doing an O-levels in music. Uh, mm -hmm. And this was, of course, Western music at that time. Yeah. But I'm not sure that I would have pursued that as the main thrust. I think it would have been languages with a focus on English and English mm -hmm. literature. Mm -hmm. And it was for that reason that I was learning Latin at O-levels. Mm -hmm. Because I thought that, you know, that was the founder of all European languages. And so, you know, maybe I would appreciate that if I knew Latin. So crazy. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> that's the <laughs> that's, that's what my mind was and 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 to the credit of my parents really I don't think they influenced any of my decisions one way or another mm -hmm. um, we were given complete freedom as children to pursue whatever we wish to do and uh, okay. they may not have felt inclined to do what I did but uh, they, they gave me the complete freedom to pick my subjects and do whatever I wished that's really that's really 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 interesting and because both of your parents were educated, your dad had yes. had his PhD, yes. your mum was a teacher. Yes. And yet they yes. they didn't, they allowed you to be. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I, I think that's the one thing that, of course, when I brought up my own daughter, that mm -hmm. was the focus of my attitude as well, that every individual should fortunately have the freedom to be who they want to be. Mm -hmm. It's not given to all of humanity, unfortunately. There are driving things that make you go one way or another. I'm perfectly aware of that. But if the opportunity is there, everyone should have the freedom of choice. And so I've been a very strong advocate of that. And when my daughter was born in India, I very much wanted her to have the kind of education that I experienced as a child. And so there are these slightly offbeat schools in India where, you know, they allow the children to be who they want to be, etc. And I was so keen that she joined that school. And she did. I, I, I was keen that she was there. She graduated from there. And the way she is, is also a result of that early education. Um, I don't think I can overemphasize and I don't suppose I need to overemphasize to this audience that it's really schooling that makes you who you are. With, of course, parental influence. I mean, yeah. obviously, your parents are a big influence at that time. But schooling can make or break you. And, I, 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 you know, higher education is okay. You, you yeah. can get your degree. You can go to get your O-levels, A-levels. But that experience at school is what shapes you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just thinking, because much of your early... <laughs> that decision, <laughs> then, to go from from the UK to Zambia, the transition again from another you're going to another co continent and another culture and different opportunities because your mm. dream of of going to you could still have gone to oxford or cambridge because they from what i understand they were still doing the um, sure. the a levels which would enable you to qualify yes but the choice of a levels were now different is that right? And then what? Absolutely. Uh, so because I had to give up all those uh, humanity subjects when I moved to Zambia, um, you know, Zambia at that time was an exceptionally wealthy country. Um, their copper industry was roaring. And so the lifestyle that we had, to be honest, in Zambia was much better than the way we were living in the UK. Um, in terms of the roads, in terms of the, you know, the, the normal infrastructure that was there. Yeah. But that was my limitation, that I had to take up science to be able to complete the required number of O-levels uh, for being able to pass mm -hmm. out. 
Um, I did exceedingly well there. I, I came first in the country. I think I had aspirations of doing medicine at that time, but it, but because I knew that, you know, my parents were saying India, 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 it seemed to me like a place where one had to be. <laughs> so I, I went back to India and then went on with my bachelor's, uh, etc. cetera. It's, 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 it's kind of strange. I, at this point of time in my life, mm -hmm. I don't feel patriotic about India. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I believe in a world view. I think mm -hmm. all humans are the same. And, you know, so even when I'm watching the Olympics, I look at it as individual excellence, not necessarily representing the country that they come from, you know, so, I, but I don't know, obviously there is a strong nationalist feeling amongst many people and I don't have that. Mm -hmm. And I feel I, I, I can support a UK athlete as much as I can support an Indian athlete or an American athlete if they're doing well. That's all that matters to me. <laughs> you know, they're at the peak of their performance, not the country they come from in so many ways. So uh, yeah, the decision to go back to India was again a major decision on my part. Um, you know, when I look back, mm -hmm especially that I've lived in London now here for a year mm -hmm. and I've visited Oxford and I visited Cambridge and I'm of course the privilege of being in Imperial right now. Um, maybe there's a little tinge of regret as to the road that I did not take, mm -hmm. but you know, this profession has given me the opportunity to travel the world and, um, mm -hmm. I, I've lived, I've been to the US, of course, I've been almost in every country in Europe, Asia. So this profession has allowed me to continue nurturing my deep held belief in one humanity and experiencing cultures as they are across the world. But perhaps, maybe if I had made a different decision. Um, the only consolation I get is if I made that decision, I would have had the daughter I had. And I wouldn't have changed that for the world. <laughs> <Right. laughs> I, I, I would love to meet your daughter. She sounds lovely. And if she didn't think oh, like her mom. She's, she's a very ordinary person, but I'm her mother. So <laughs> that, that's the reason. <laughs> All right. the, the, it's really interesting the way that you summarize that, because one of the things which it sounds to me like is that especially when you spoke about the the non-nationalistic perspective um, and saying that you not that you don't you want to see excellence you want to see people excel but not necessarily necessarily at the expense of saying this is because my country is better than your country which is yeah. something which we often we, we see it all the time we see it all the time. There's patriotism yes. and things, but it's when it boils over to say that, you know, we are better because mm -hmm. it, whenever we put that connotation, it's always belittling somebody else, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Absolutely. Yeah. You're absolutely um, right. And, and I'm just thinking about it in terms of the fact that it was especially during your formative years that you had traveled so, to so many countries, but yet it was at that point when you were in the Zambia and or when your parents, their ultimate dream was always for them to go home, right? Yes. And for them, home yes. is India. So I suppose yes. part of my question is, um, where do you see as home? I had hoped you would not ask me that question I'm sorry. Be because I feel much more at home here in London than I actually do in Bangalore, in India. There are certain cultural norms and societal norms in India that are actually antithetical to everything I believe. It's a very patriarchal society there are very defined roles amongst the majority of the population as to the role of women. We're making some headway there, but when you're dealing with 1.2 billion people, it's extremely difficult to make an impact uh, at a small level. Um, there are attitudes, there are behavioral norms, which I find far more comfortable here 
Mm. You know, the courtesy of waiting at a zebra crossing when you want to cross or the courtesy of letting the person in front of you walk through the door. I mean, these are small things, which, again, maybe it's because I am in Imperial and I'm living in Chelsea. And so all of these are really nice parts of London. And the only places I've visited have been theatres and musicals. And so there again, you meet a certain section of society, which is, you know, (laughs) I obviously Bangalore is my home. I mean, India is, you know, it's it's the one country I can walk walk into without a visa, which mm. makes a big difference. You know, everywhere else, I need permission to be able to enter the country. Yeah. But with, yeah, but with India, I I don't need that permission. So to that extent, I have to be grateful to India for giving me whatever it has because I'm here with an entire career spent in India. And uh, I think that's that's been good. I, I, I appreciate what the country has done for me. But culturally and socially, I think I could live here very happily. Yeah. <laughs> provided, provided, and this is an important point. I've been thinking about this while I've been here for the year. I think what has allowed me to settle here so comfortably is the fact that I had Imperial College to come to, which was mm-hmm. my profession during the day. Um, I'm not sure that I could live here without anything to do. I mean, I don't think I could retire here in that sense. I think there, that would be India, you know, where I could kind of settle down and disappear into the earth. But I'm, but being here professionally engaged has been an absolute treat and an absolute pleasure. Again, it goes back to when I'm think, thinking about what you've said, it almost goes back to, again, that protection that your education has provided you. Yeah. It's, it's been that protective shield throughout your life in terms of a, a wraparound because of it's almost it's very interesting that you gave the analogy of the Olympics and the, the, the excellence associated with that. The fact that you were able to excel academically has provided you with the opportunities for you to progress. And that's given you that that level of comfort to to accept. And confidence. And, and confidence. And confidence. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I've never felt nervous going to another country, uh, somewhere where I've never been. Mm-hmm. I feel I have it. I, I can handle it. I can manage wherever I am. I can manage whoever I have to meet. So, yes. I think education and the kind of education that you get does make you the person that you are. Mm -hmm. And uh, we should really strive to educate, and I'm saying this in inverted commas, Mm -hmm. as many people as we can and uh, bring them to a level where they all have that level of confidence and conviction that, if they want to do something, they're able to do it. Um, I think that's the true measure of a society. Yeah. And while there are many, many problems in the US of A, um, I think if you think about the origin of some of its achievers, it's amazing that they came from the background that they came, the first yeah. immigrants in the country going on, second generation become presidents or vice presidents. I mean, that that's a big deal. Yeah, <laughs> so absolutely. I, I, so I think uh, maybe a little bit of this, a little bit of that, that would be an ideal haven, which I don't think exists anywhere in the world. <laughs> but that's what we would like to strive for. No, that's that's amazing. That really is amazing. I'm going to... I'm. I think it would be it would be remiss of me if I don't investigate a little bit more about your academic career and what it is mm-hmm. that you you do um, for the audience. And can you summarize what it is that that you do um, as an academic? So after completing my PhD in biochemistry, um, I joined AstraZeneca, which was just set up a research center in Bangalore at that time. Mm. Um, most of my colleagues uh, who finished PhD with me went abroad, mostly to the US. But I had a child at that time. My daughter was there. My husband was, you know, in based in Bangalore. And uh, I just didn't think it was right. And I didn't feel like leaving them and, you know, taking off. and Because it was not possible for them to join me at that time. 
given the job my husband was doing. So um, I joined AstraZeneca and after about five or six years there, I realized that uh, corporate science was not my calling. And fortunately for me, my alma mater in the Institute of Science had positions available in a new department. And very unusually, they recruited me because almost everyone joining that institute has had four or five years of postdoctoral experience outside India. But I was the only one who stayed on in India. Uh, perhaps, I don't know, maybe I made an impact when I was a PhD student and they felt that, okay, she could do it, etc. So I joined as an assistant professor and my focus there was really on biochemistry in the first few years. But again, I realized when I look back at my career that again, because of this diversity that I've always wanted in my life, I started dabbling in many things. I started thinking about mycobacterial pathogenesis. Uh, right now, I'm focusing on gut physiology. Um, we working along with international collaborators in Norway were the first to identify a mutation in a particular gene that I've been interested in, which uh, is associated with Crohn's disease on mm. irritable bowel syndrome. Mm. Um, this was the very first report of a mutation in that gene. And the only reason they approached me was because we'd been publishing on that receptor for some years from India. And uh, it was quite extraordinary that the Norwegians decided to approach me to be able to do some of the characterization. And uh, that was a, a, a big paper that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine. So that naturally caused a big, uh, a big you know, interest. Yeah. And of course, uh, a lot of other clinicians picked up on it and they've collaborated with me. We've characterized a few other mutations. We went on to develop mouse models. And uh, the focus essentially is to understand why this receptor results in inflammation in the gut. What are the mechanisms that it's doing in the intestinal cell? And um, in the process, we've been able to develop organoid models. These are new models where you could develop you know, tissue architecture. Interestingly, we did it in India and that's what I brought with me to Imperial. Wow. So I've shipped those organoids here and I'm working with those here. Of course, I've been interacting with the human organoid facility in Imperial as well. So overall, it's been a really, um, the, so my focus is biochemistry. I would still call myself a biochemist, but we've done animal physiology. We've done cell culture. We've done bacterial culture. We've done microbiology. Again, the diversity. I can't stick in one thing for a long time. <laughs> I need to jump around. So, you know, I, but right now the focus is on gut physiology, the role of the microbiome uh, in these mouse models and how that might impinge on the inflammation that is seen. So these are some of the crux of what I do. That's fantastic. That's, fa I'm going to ask, I'm, I'm going to go, the, I'm going to go to one, one more place, right? If anyone mm -hmm. else has any questions which they'd like to ask, just put your hand up at, around this point and uh, I'll come to you. But there were, as a as a woman in science, have you experienced barriers to um, the progress? Um, and if so, in what way? And how have you overcome them? I think working in India, without doubt, it's taken a long time for women to be considered as leaders in their field. I was at that mid generation where there was still a lot of uh, patriarchal attitude towards women. Um, there was a protective attitude. I don't think there was any discrimination, but they always felt that, oh, we need to look after these people and we need to take care of them. And many of us didn't feel comfortable with that. We said that we could stand on our own. We don't need your protection. So mm -hmm. during my career, I've been a very strong advocate of promoting women in science, especially in India. Um, I've been the chair of a number of committees which deal with fostering women in the scientific sphere, right from school onwards. So it's schools that where girls need to believe that science can be a career for them, science or, and or engineering. Um, we've been setting up committees in the Institute to take care of women faculty who might experience some difficulties. Um, I championed a cause for a far more lenient maternal leave process for faculty in the Institute, uh, because when they join, they're on tenure track. And then what happens is that's the age when, you know, you might wish to have a child that takes away maybe six months or more of your yeah. productive career. 
But then what happens is that you're not up for promotion for another six months. And if you get promotion, you're given promotion six months later than your male colleague. So we now have a new policy, which we really pushed, where women can take two breaks during that tenure track. And even if they take two breaks of six months each, their promotion, when it is given, will be with back effect at the same time as when the man will be yeah. promoted, which is after five years. Yeah. So, you know, we I've been trying to do some of those things uh, in my career, apart from whatever the science I do. I think this was a very important aspect of something I really believed in and wanted to foster. No, that's amazing because uh, I, I totally understand what you're saying with regards to um, one, the protection and not necessarily needing that level of protection in or the way in which it's yeah. it's um, kind of like manifests itself. And then the second part about those discriminations between um, childbearing age and almost having to make a decision I'm going to do this or I'm going to do yes. that and not yes. feeling that there's a way back in to be able yes. to say you know I'm I haven't lost my mind just because I've I've had a child etc yes. yeah. I'm still you know <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> you know yes. um yes and 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 having having that as a as a as a push forward I think is really good um so what would you like to see going forward how what what things would you like to see developed um either that you can influence or you'd just like to see it work more cohesively within either the environment that you're currently in or just generally i'm a strong believer of uh you know, it's, it's, it's difficult for an individual to change the world mm -hmm. unless they happen to be president of the USA or something like that. <laughs> but for normal people like us, <laughs> I think we can make a micro-influential effect. So, for example, what has been the focus for me is within my laboratory, make absolutely no distinction between my girl PhD students and my male PhD students. And many of my girl students have come to me and said that I've been a source of inspiration for them in the sense that they can believe they can do it. And I think what I'm most delighted about is when I look at the 30 odd students who passed with a PhD from my lab, it's a 15, 50, 50 ratio. So I've had mm -hmm. equal number of boys and girls and all the women are still productively engaged in the doing of science in very, very competent levels. And when I look at my male colleagues, where also the distribution of sexes is about normal, many of the girls have dropped out of active scientific careers. Mm. Uh, I, I don't have the statistics, especially from my institute, but I would like to go back and delve a little deeper into that. So girls who've passed out of laboratories run by women, do they tend to retain their mm. profession in active scientific pursuit? Mm. Mm. Um, is it just because they had an example that was set when they were studying at that formative yeah. time, you know, when you're doing your PhD? I think as far as, you know, this affirmative action is concerned, um, we don't want to be given special privileges, but all things being equal, pick the woman. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen in my institute sometimes is while we have a number of applicants who are almost the same, there is no conscious effort to pick the woman to increase the representation of women in the environment. So you'd be appalled to hear that in my institute of about almost 450 faculty, there must be just 30 women. It's, oh, it's wow. appalling. It is appalling. And there was a concerted effort to recruit women faculty. Um, but, you know, many of the women feel they're not good enough. And that's, mm -hmm. again, you know, that feeling that women have that am I smart enough to get into this institute, etc. But it is, it, is, it is a real shame that an institute like mine has such a 
poor representation of women faculty. And uh, I don't know how long it'll take to change that. And we've done what we could uh, to try to promote women and give women a voice on campus. But, um, you know, all the directors have been men. All the senior people have been men. And there's never a prejudice. It's just that mm -hmm. they don't seem to understand that this is a problem. You, yeah. you, it, it, it's not okay. Your institution must reflect society as a whole. And if women are 50% of the population, you can't be telling me that you don't have 50% of women scientists yeah. worth recruiting. This is, there's a couple of questions based on what you've, you've said there, which kind of like spring to mind. First one is, who was your role models? when you were going through did you have role models did you have mentors no i didn't and this is something that uh, is somewhat a little alien surprisingly in indian culture so in indian culture we have what are called gurus which are supposed mm -hmm. to be know all and be all and so therefore there's no questioning of what they tell you to do i had no role model when i was doing my science or my career um what i've done is i've just just done what I've had to do. I don't think there was anyone that I looked at. Did I have a mentor in the Institute? No, I did not have. My PhD supervisor was there, but he was a difficult person. He was difficult and uh, he was a good scientist, but not a very nice person to mm. interact with and mm. feel comfortable with. Mm. And uh, many times I've told my colleagues that the one thing I learned from my PhD was how not to be a supervisor. And so whatever whatever my supervisor was, I decided I would be the opposite. Yeah. So I, I, I don't think I had mentorship at that level. Um, I, und and I understand that now I, I am actually serving as a mentor of more than a dozen Wellcome Trust uh, DBT uh, fellows mm -hmm. in India who approached me to be their mentor, um, which means that presumably they see some merit in, in what I might be standing for. But me personally, no. I, I, I really wish I could say somebody was, but really no. Um, that that it, it wasn't something that I was fortunate enough to have uh, in my career. The but it's important. It's important. No, and I really, yeah, it's extremely important. And maybe there is a twinge of regret, but it allowed me to do things the way I thought that they should be done. That's all. So I'm, I'm going I'm to, I'm just going to press you on this just slightly, right? Because mm -hmm. you said that you didn't have, but I think I'm going to, I'm going to challenge that assumption. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to challenge that. And yeah, I'm going to sure. say that I think, I think you're, your mum and your dad oh, yeah. were your were your role models, were the ones totally. Yeah. Right? Because oh, hundred yeah. I, I assumed you meant a professional mentor. But, 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 um, but I, absolutely. I think absolutely I I one hundred percent. My I, parents yeah, have because, made me who I am. Absolutely. Yeah. But not just who yeah. you are as an individual, but because mm. your father was an academic in his own mm. right, in the way that yes. he conducted his studies. And I think yes. from that, the way that he influenced you, your mother influenced you, meant that yes. because you then encountered, as you said, the only thing he taught me was how not to be. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <You know>? Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, Absolutely. So not, yeah. And I think yeah. it was those core values those core values that were ingrained in you, which meant that your sense of belonging, your sense of identity, which they had inculcated into you, meant that, okay, I can tolerate all of this because I know that that's not me. That's right. 100%. I, I, as I thought your question related to my professional mentorship. Yeah, it but was. But... Without doubt, without doubt, the person I am now is because of the influence that my parents had on me, which at the time, I don't think I realized that, <laughs> you know, you never do. You yeah. realize it only much, much later. Yeah. And you say, why am I the way I am? And now you have no hesitation in saying that my father, his enthusiasm for life, his, in, in, his energy, his ability to 
call a spade a spade, which made him quite unpopular when he went back to India. But, yeah. uh, you know, his ability to speak up and speak up for people. Mm -hmm. My mother, her patience, her tolerance, her understanding, they were complete opposites, actually. You know, <laughs> So I, it was really nice to get that balance. And I think none of the three of us children can emulate them in the way that they were. They, mm -hmm. they, they are, they were really very, very special people. Mm -hmm. And uh, when my daughter was growing up uh, in India, we have this privilege of being children looked after by grandparents, right? We have a very close family set yeah. up. So we lived very close to my parents. And so my mother took care of my daughter while I was at work and working yeah. as much as I needed to. And uh, a lot of people would say, are you okay leaving them with your parents? I said, if they can bring her up the way they brought me up, I have no problem whatsoever. <laughs> I think they did. They will do a much better job than I would do. <laughs> and my daughter was brought up by my mother and my father who doted on her. So, I mean, I think uh, they, she, she's done. She's lucky. <laughs> she was Fantastic. lucky. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. The, 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 I, this has been a really brilliant um, conversation. There's a couple. Of, there, there are so many things which I want to explore with you. Um, I really do appreciate your honesty about about those experiences. Those being a, although you didn't have a role model, it's clear to me that you have become a role model, and you take that responsibility very seriously. Very seriously. Yeah, I do. And it, it nothing touches me more than when a young faculty member approaches me and says, can I put you as a mentor on a grant or something like that? And, and you know, these are people who I never knew until they joined the Institute and mm -hmm. then spoke to me about uh, stuff. And I would just give them an opinion or two. So it's, it's, it's been a real privilege, actually, to have been able to mentor in the way that... Um, Without without a dictatorial kind of attitude, you must do this, you must do that, but just provide an opening or a sounding board for them, yeah. um, you know, just for them to vent their anguish or their joys or whatever they may choose to. So yeah. um, I've always felt extremely comfortable with younger colleagues. And so therefore, I think that's been a that's that's been a great, great privilege I've had. Fantastic. All right. I'm going to ask my final two questions. All right. And they're kind of like the same question, but asked in slightly different ways. So the first of those questions is, what advice would you have given to your younger self? That's the first one. And then the second <clears throat> question, what do you think your younger self will look at you now and say, wow, All right? <laughs> the younger self looking at me now will say, you're totally crazy. What happened to your languages? What happened to your music? What happened to your literature? I, I, I'm sure that younger self would never have imagined that I could have been able to do what I've been able to do in the sciences. Yeah. So I think uh, that's there. What advice would I give my younger self? Uh, possibly, I, I, I don't know. I, I think she made the decisions that were best for her at that time mm. without any undue pressure or influence from anyone else. And uh -huh. I think they've worked out okay, as I've mm -hmm. said. There are always different trajectories a life can take. And, mm -hmm. you know, especially when you're younger, you make choices mm -hmm. which take you one way. And, you know, in many countries in the world, it's not really possible for you to backtrack and start again. So, especially in a country like India, the minute I got into science, there was no way that I could come back to the humanities in India. Mm. And with the difficulty in India, as you know, it's so culturally diverse with so many languages that, mm -hmm. you know, even to imbibe that culture, to come back to it would have, would have been superhuman effort for my side. Mm -hmm. And I didn't find that appealing. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I think the younger self, she did OK. She, she made a decision. She stuck by that decision. And uh, she's all right. She's here. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that. The, go on, go on. Sorry. In, this day in Imperial has been amazing. I, I, I remember when the offer letter came, I kind of looked at it and said, 
B, Imperial College, London. You know, it's like it's a full circle to what I had dreamt of as a child yeah. to be yeah. in a leading university in the UK. Yeah. And to have been here for this one year has been absolutely tremendous. Fantastic. I, I, I'm i so glad that we were able to meet and to have these conversations because they, they've been enlightening for me. And I, I, I really have enjoyed your candor, your humor and and how we've we've explored um, your sense of belonging and your sense of your identity. So I want to say a really big thank you for for being our guest this week. Okay. And a big thank you to you too for asking me. It's been a pleasure to talk about all this. Fantastic. I'm going to just share what we've got coming up next week. So if I just... Um, sorry. Two. Right. So next week we're going to have Abigail um, Bang, um, Bamboy. And she's a... Um, She's currently doing an MBA at Wharton College in the US. Um, she was a former student here at Imperial College, and she's going to be sharing her experiences with us next week. Um, if you have missed any of the other um, interviews that we've done on belonging, then please go to our YouTube channel, which is tinyurl.com forward slash belonging dash IAO. You'll be able to hear the the other videos which we've posted there and I always say this at the end it's such a privilege to be able to speak to so many brilliant people to hear their the, the things which we may look at them and wonder how did they get there what were the the factors that nobody just appears as, in a position where they're that they're in without there have being sacrifices and other things which have influenced them so for so many to have shared those stories with us i just have to say a really big thank you um and understanding how it, they gain their sense of identity and belonging is all what we're about here so enjoy your weekend enjoy the sun and we'll see you again next week as we share another episode of belonging so thank you very much. Thank you.